Hi, everyone. Welcome to Code Mentor Events. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. My name is Claire, and I will be your host for today's event. Before we get started, I just want to share some quick instruction on how to use our tool for your best event experience. So if you have any questions throughout the event, please put them in the Q&A section, which you can access by clicking on the Q&A in the toolbar. Our speaker will get to them at the end of the events. And during the events, please make sure to mute yourself so it doesn't get disturbance during the event. So yeah, that will be all for me. And without further ado, let's welcome our speaker for today. Jondos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Claire. Welcome everyone. Uh, today we are gonna talk about how to receive feedback to maximize your growth. And before we start, First, my name is John Dost, and I'm a software engineering manager, and I write a lot on my blog, and I have a newsletter, so you can visit johndost.blog, and I'm also on Twitter if you want to follow. Um, so a few years ago, I had a, I read a book, I, I bought a book, and I read it thoroughly about this book. And this book, like in, in 2014, Douglas Stone and Sheila Heen, if I pronounce correctly, from the Harvard Negotiation Project, and also the authors of Difficult Conversation book, uh, came together and published this book called Thanks for the Feedback. In 300 or so pages, they talked about how to receive feedback well. They didn't focus on software engineers specifically or any other profession, but they doubled down on receiving aspect of the feedback. So today, I will focus on their findings to answer four questions. So first one is why should we focus on receiving feedback? And second one, how, why do we become defensive and how do we prevent it when we hear feedback, especially harsh feedback? And third, what kinds of feedback do we usually get? And what do we do from now on? So why receiving? So we should focus on how to get feedback together with how to receive or how to give feedback. Mastering this receiving feedback skills will drive our learning and curiosity forward. We always focus on giving effective feedback because many people, like many companies, managers around us, they, they tell us that we should give feedback to our peers, our managers across company, and et cetera. But whoever receives the feedback is more important to hand over the feedback rights. Because, because whatever we say, we'll be limited to how the other side understands us. So it is similar to a teacher who gives the same lesson to all students in a class. So if, imagine if you are, you are in a class, it's up to us to pull this information from the teacher in a way that we learn and become successful. Everybody receives the same lesson in the class, but some people understand better than others. So feedback is not that different. The same applies to our actual whole life. We learn by pulling this feedback or the information, even in the toughest situations, like such as when we are not in the mood or the feedback is delivered to us very, very poorly. So we need to learn and feed our curiosity somehow. So when we think about it, what blocks us while receiving feedback? Even though we love feedback, we ask for it, we seek it, we, we easily go behind the walls when we receive a harsh one. So why? Because we have an inner voice that never stays silent. Whenever we hear negative feedback, it just lights up and starts firing back. That's when we react badly and reject the feedback. So when we think about it, what triggers these blocks? What, what, what's happening in our inner voice? What prevents us from getting feedback truly? There are three triggers that they talk about in the book that makes us defensive. The first is truth. The second one is relationship, and the third one is identity. Let's dive in each, each one separately. So the truth, the truth trigger. When we receive a feedback, we, we put these defense walls. When the other side, the feedback giver, is simply put wrong, when we think they're wrong. For example, they might come and tell us that we didn't take responsibility when there was a big incident. But in reality, we indeed took responsibility and have done a great amount of work. Yet, they don't see, right? So other side is simply wrong. There's actually no feedback. However, they approached us to give feedback, so there, there must be something there. 
They think that they are giving feedback. So what's happening there? To uncover this case, we need to understand actually three different kinds of feedback. These kinds of feedback are appreciation, evaluation, and coaching. In appreciation feedback, it's the feedback we love to get, right? It's like it's authentic, specific, and giving in a way that we want. For example, when our managers approach us and say, hey, great job. And or for example, our peer comes up and says, hey, I really appreciate your help during the debugging issue last week. I learned a lot thanks to you. That's the appreciation feedback. And we have the evaluation feedback. This feedback is to evaluate our skills and also aligning expectations and clarifying the consequences of our actions. For example, when our manager comes up and says, hey, we increased your compensation by 80% because you're a high achiever. You exceeded our expectations last year. I've never heard like 80% increase, by the way, but I'm just saying like, <laughs> I hope everyone gets 80%. Uh, but at the same time, this feedback is, the goal of this feedback is to rate us against some standards and expectations. That's the evaluation feedback. The coaching feedback, this feedback, like the feedback is to give us some direction. It's aimed at like trying to help us learn, grow or change. The coach aims to fix a problem or make an improvement in our lives. For example, one of our tech leads might come and say, hey, you should work on your debugging skills or your, our manager can come up and say, hey, you need to improve your communication skills and here is the book that I recommend you read. But now we know these three different kinds of feedback, but where does these problems happen? The problems arise when we expect one of them, but then we receive the other. When we expect the evaluation feedback, but when we receive coaching, we, we become defensive. Don't get me wrong, like we need all three of them, like appreciation, evaluation, and coaching. We need all three of them. But we feel very disappointed and become defensive when we expect one and receive the other. When we expect an appreciation, for example, this is very common. And when we receive coaching saying, hey, you need to improve these skills while we are expecting, hey, you did a great job then we put our defense walls and don't accept the coaching there. So we need to understand some differences to, to figure out the situation. For that one, like, we need to dive into like, our understanding of the person and us. Everyone has their own rules in their heads. Like we, we also have our own, each one of us individually. We interpret and evaluate the situations around us and other people's behaviors with our rules in our heads. The events, situations, and also the available data, they are all same for everyone, right? So for example, when there's an announcement at work that some organizational change will happen, people interpret the news differently and they react differently to, to these changes. So they like, they, some of them really like this change, some of them are very disappointed and et cetera. So many misunderstandings and conflicts happen because we see our rules in our head as not our rules, but the rules that applies to everyone. That's, that's, that's the major problem. That's why we first need to understand the available data in this situation. And later we can learn our own rules and the rules of other people. Only then we interpret why our defense mechanism is triggered. This approach gives us different opportunities to give feedback at the same time and understand the feedback we receive. And also there are like behaviors and intentions. These are two different things. The only phase that's like, the, I really like this sentence to be honest. The only phase we don't see and cannot read is ours. We always think about our thoughts, our feelings and intentions but we don't focus on how they impact our behavior and how other people perceive it. On the other side of the equation, we always watch other people's behavior and try to guess their intentions. So whenever we see that their behaviors is off from their intention, we start giving them coaching feedback. And that's also what happens to us. To understand people's intentions when they give feedback, we need to change our approach. 
since we are talking about truth feedback, truth triggers, instead of saying, hey, your feedback is not true, it's untrue, we should more focus, say, hey, tell me more. Tell me more, what do you think? Tell me more, why, why do you think in that way? And we need to listen to them. We should talk about the purpose of their feedback and discuss to figure out the type of feedback they give. If we can, we also need to separate evaluation and from coaching and appreciation that I will come back to this one a bit later. So we talked about the true triggers. The next one is relationships. In relationship triggers, the feedback in these relationships is never about the other person or it's, not, it's never about us. It's about the other person and us together. It's a two-way street. When we hear feedback from someone else, and if they are close to us, such as partners or managers, we receive the feedback according to our relationship lens in our, in our relationship. So it's never independent of the relationship and it's never in one direction. So for example, when our manager says, hey, you could have been more friendly when the stakeholder requested a change in the last meeting, that's the feedback, right? Our manager doesn't only tell us about our behavior. They include our relationship and how they feel about our behavior and how it impacts them. Our manager also has concerns about the team's presence with our stakeholders and how we impact that. This also affects how they want to work with us. The person who gives us feedback and our relationship, there's an end there, affect the feedback. Sorry. Um, we react to who they are, not what they say. What we think about the person and how we are treated causes us to make a reaction. A similar situation, this is a really good example. The similar situation happens when our parents say, you never tidy up your room. And we respond with like, that's my room. Stop intervening my life. So our reaction is based on our relationship. Our room may be indeed a mess, but what our parents say is not about that, right? It's not about that. So what we actually do here is to switch the track we are on. When our parents tell us that we never tidy up our room, it's about our room. Our, and our response here is about how they intervene in our life. Those are two different tracks. When our manager tells us about our friend, unfriendliness in the last meeting, it's about our friendliness or unfriendliness. It's not about how many times this stakeholder requests something, some change, at the last minute before we release the feature to production. So the first topic is about our approach in this meeting. And the second topic is about a good time to bring up the requests. So the feedback becomes, in the end, us versus them, while focusing on different subjects. In these situations, we need to be careful and not change the track. Another thing we should understand is the relationship system itself. To understand the relationship system, we need to take three steps back. The first step is them and us. It's like we need to step back and look at what each of us, feedback receiver and us, feedback giver and us, are doing in reaction to other. Once we have done this, we start to notice common and bigger patterns. So that was the first step. We need to take the second step to understand what our roles are in this relationship. If, like, the, uh, for example, if your manager gives us uh, some some feedback, is this about like manager to to, uh, to a direct report, or it's about like a friend to friend? If you are we are close with our managers, so we need to understand our role clashes. Like, if two peers are giving each other feedback, we need to understand what each of their role in this situation are. The third step, to see the bigger picture, we need to understand how the environment contributes to the feedback we hear. We shouldn't load any responsibility, like we, should, we shouldn't load all responsibility into anyone or any system. We need to understand how all factors play a role by looking at them each one by one. So when we, talk, we talked about giving, like having an organizational change, for example, if our company is going over very stressful times, the feedback we, we receive will have a part of it in this, like the, the, the environment we are in will have an impact on this feedback. 
if we are in a very relaxed environment, then our how we trigger a little bit very different. So we talked about truth, we talked about relationship, and the third one was identity. And this is a bit a bit different. The feedback here when we receive like the identity triggers actually threats our identity. So if, for example, if we define ourselves uh, as reliable and we get feedback that says we forget to do things all the time or often or frequently, our identity is threatened and we put up walls say, no, 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 I'm not like that. I'm a reliable person. So we need to understand our story. What are thoughts and feelings? We need to understand our emotions and where they come from because they change how we receive feedback. Also, when we consider our story, we should tie the feedback to the present because our feelings tend to exaggerate feedback when we tie them to the past and when we tie them to the future. For example, we shouldn't tell ourselves like, hey, I was always opinionated and I don't think I will change. Like we are tying it to the, to the, um, to the past. The same applies for the future. This, like, another example will be uh, if our manager tells us, hey, you don't know how to behave in a meeting, same feedback, we shouldn't think of it as like, I will never learn how to talk in a meeting because like, that's, that's tying the future. We are exaggerating the feedback. Our past and future stories tend to exaggerate the feedback. So we need to take the feedback in this moment, the exact moment. So like, for example, the same example, like, hey, you, you don't know how to behave in a meeting if the feed, if we get this feedback, it's like, okay, I didn't behave in the meet in that meeting right. It's like not thinking the past, not thinking the future, focusing on now. Then we put the feedback into present. We don't exaggerate and take the feedback as it is, simple. And also we need to figure out our feedback footprint. Our reactions to the feedback define how the feedback giver perceives our feedback receiving skills. When we react with anger or cry when we receive harsh feedback, it creates a picture of how we cannot handle the feedback if we are not aware of it. These behaviors are the feedback footprints that are unique to us and each of us has, their, has our own. Most of, but the, the problem here is not having the feedback footprint, the problem here is being, not being aware of these feedback footprints because then we are not ready to face the harsh feedback. To, fa to find out our feedback footprints, we can ask ourselves like, how do I typically behave when I receive feedback? This is a good strategy to help us learn our unintentional behaviors. And don't get me wrong, like being angry and crying is completely normal. But once we know that what, what our feedback footprint is, it's very hard to say, uh, what our feedback footprint is, then we can actually prepare ourselves to, to, to the situation directly. So we can, if we cry, for example, that's okay. If we cry, then we can say, hey, um, that's normal. Like I, I react to this way, to the feedback when I receive, uh, and then let the other person know who is giving us feedback to, to continue properly. Like may, we might take a break. We can say, hey, let's stop it now and I will come back to you later, and etc. So once we know, we can handle the difficult situations more easily. And also we need to change our mindset a little bit. Researchers found that whenever we have a growth mindset, we see the negative feedback as less threatening and more of an opportunity than we see when we had the fixed mindset. For example, instead of saying I procrastinate and I do things at the last minute, we should embrace more complexity and be open to different and changing identities. For example, yes, maybe uh, this time I did it in the last minute, maybe next time I might do it before, before last minute. Maybe I, I'm not gonna procrastinate next time. When there is no feedback, actually, our growth mindset will look for cues to learn these improvements that we can make. And we will start pulling the feedback, even if there is nothing around. For example, when we, have, when we open a new pull request in our repository, we might start reviewing our own pull request like someone else showed it, instead of thinking, I know how to write, how to write a good code. 
then we we can we can think ourselves as a, like, hey, I'm a code reviewer. Maybe that's the time. Maybe next time we will think I don't know how we will just push it and don't don't review it. But this time I might review it because I'm thinking today as a code reviewer. Then we embrace this growth. So we need to cultivate complexity in our identity overall. And this mindset will show us various ways to grow. Last but not least, there are three things we have to accept about ourselves. We will make mistakes, definitely. Everyone makes mistakes and we are going to make mistakes too. And we have complex intentions. We talked about intentions and they are complex. And we need to accept this, like, hey, I have complex intentions every time it might change. And the third, we have contributed to the problem. Whatever feedback we are receiving, there's a problem there because we are receiving a feedback. Or maybe we are giving feedback. It doesn't really matter. Even if we are giving feedback, we contribute to the problem. So we shouldn't look only from one perspective. Try to understand the whole situation. And we have been complicated all the time, and it's not going to change. So we talked about a lot of things. Let's sum up. First, whenever we are uncomfortable while getting feedback, we need to try to understand what triggers our feelings. If the feedback is some, simply untrue, like it's a trigger, true trigger, we need to try to uncover what kind of feedback the other person is trying to give. We need to ask questions to understand their intention. As we only see their behaviors, once we understand what they think and how they arrive at that feedback, we can redirect them to the type of feedback we want. For example, we said about uh, evaluation, appreciation, and coaching feedback. Are any like most of the companies on annual performance reviews are coming up, so we are in end of October almost. Um, and if you have a chance. Ask your manager to separate evaluation from coaching and appreciation during a performance review. First, have the appreciation feedback, and then have the evaluation. And last, get the coaching during the whole year, not in the performance review. If you are a manager already, try to do it with your direct reports. So if the triggers about our relationship, not the truth, we need to stay on the track. For example, if our peer tells us that our code is not testable, it's about our code. It's not something else. We need to take the three steps back when we have these relationship triggers to understand the situation. First, understand where we and the feedback giver stands. Then, how our roles are in this relationship. And last, how the environment we are in contributes to the situation and to our relationship. If the trigger is about identity, we need to look at our life story and how we define ourselves. Instead of sticking to certain definitions, like hey, I procrastinate all the time, that's me, that's who I am, we need to embrace the growth mindset and have this all complexity, complex identity. And we should accept that we will make mistakes and we have complex intentions and we have contributed to the problem. Thank you. Now we can go to questions. Right, thank you. Thank you, Jonas, for your talk. And we will dive right into the questions. So if you have any questions right now, you can also put in the Q&A, we will get to them. Okay, the, the first one is from Karen. Um, yeah, the question is, what's the name of the book that you talked about at the beginning? Yeah, it's the uh, Thanks for the Feedback. Wait, I'm going to open the slides so you can see the full um, name. Thanks for the feedback from Douglas Stone and Sheila Heen. I, I, I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. The subtitle is The Science and the Art of Receiving Feedback. And I definitely recommend everyone reading this book. It's 300 or some pages, but it's very dense. Okay, awesome. And the next one is um from not sure if i can pronounce this right but i'm gonna try um kagate do you think yeah, it i think i it? can chatai okay it sounds turkish yeah okay um 
asked, do you think is it right to give a personal feedback inside the 30 people's meeting? It uh, depends on the company and the culture you are in. So there's another book called The Culture Map. And I also recommend everyone to read that one. And they, they like Aaron Meyer, the, the author of the book, also talks about feedback there. And uh, the, the important part is how the culture is. So some, in some cultures, uh, that's all right. Like, for example, stereotypical uh, Dutch culture they are open to giving feedback in front of 30, 100 people. It doesn't really matter because the point is to make an improvement. It's not a bad thing to say. Even if you're like, you can go up and say the same, like give the feedback in front of others to your CEO, for example, in a 300, 400 people company, maybe in a thousand company. So it's not about the feedback. It's about how you give it and what's the culture there. So if you're in a Turkish culture, the culture where I am come from, it's not right to give the give a feedback inside the Turkish people, people meeting. But if you are working at Dutch company with Dutch people, I'm talking about stereotypical uh, cultures, uh, then it's it's okay. But you need to understand, like you need to go ask some questions to figure out what's the culture there, or, or you can read the culture map book and try try some some exer- running some exercises in your company to figure out. But I recommend first understanding what the culture is in the company, if it's all right or not. Even in the same company, the person is also important. Like, for example, you might be in a Dutch company, but your CEO uh, is not a person who accepts or who gets, who likes to get feedback in front of others. So it depends on the person. So I would recommend like, write them a message and say, hey, um, I have a feedback. How would you like to uh, receive your feedback? Uh, then you can they can tell you like hey let's have a call or write me on Slack or next time in a meeting it's up to them. Awesome. Okay, and the next one is from again Edgar. Is there a way to structure a meeting, for example, one on one, to help follow your steps? Uh, I'm not sure if I get the question 100% correctly. Um, there are a lot of one-on-one templates that you can use. I have also one that I shared on my blog. You can have a look. And and also, if you ask me, one-on-one, especially one-on-one meetings are for engineers overall, if you're like talking with your manager, I'm assuming. Um, and their managers, not the owner of the meeting, and I think the engineers should be the owner of the meeting and then run the meeting by themselves. Uh, I, have a, I have a blog post about that one. Like, if you go to my blog and search one on one, effective one on one or something, then you will definitely find two, two blog posts. One is the template, and the other one is how to own one on one meetings. But there, like, depends on the meeting that you're running. Um, if we are talking about annual performance reviews, it's very different. Like, when the last time I had my annual performance review, I asked my manager to give me the evaluation feedback and appreciation feedback during the uh, the, the talk we had before. Uh, and then like I asked them, hey, can you give me appreciation first? And then the evaluation, we can talk. It can be also two different meetings. It's up to you and your manager. Uh, but that worked for me. Like my, my manager was also really happy because they were able to separate different things and they were able to put it in a frame, actually, that, that made their jobs easy. So I also, I also did the same uh, to, to my direct reports uh, as I'm a manager. And people usually like, tend to like it like, because we separated the coaching from the annual performance reviews. That was really good because I didn't, for example, as a manager, I didn't need to prepare for coaching. And we said, let's distribute this to our whole year in our one-on-one meetings. And today we are going to talk about what things that you have done great and how do we evaluate you according to our expectations and some standards. That's all. That worked really great. And I recommend everyone to try. If your manager doesn't like it, they will tell you. But then they will also see that you are trying to improve things. You are trying to learn things and you are trying to change things. So it will definitely help to talk about. I hope that answers. Awesome. Okay, the next one is from Eamon and asks, how can I approve on board? I'm That's not really sure I got the <laughs> question. Can you elaborate, uh, Yeah. 
Yeah, if you can elaborate a little bit on what you're trying to ask, that would be great and a little bit more helpful on how we can answer that. And another one is from Karim as well. Ask, what do you think about being micromanaged? That, that, that's a very um, difficult question. I hate micromanaging as a manager and I hate being micromanaged as an employee. So I don't like it. I think, especially in creative industry, like if it might work in some industries, like for example, I have a relative who is a boss in a company. Uh, they are doing a lot of, um, like they're working the buildings, making, like building the buildings actually. Um, so in their area, I talked with, with him, I think uh, two months ago, he's more micromanaging because he has to know every single thing that's going on there uh, because he's also an engineer at the same time. And, but in the software engineering, it's very, very different. Like we are the creative people as a software engineers. And if you, tr if anyone tries to micromanage a creative person, then it sounds like a trouble because the creative process doesn't have anything that is set of standards that you can every single time follow, right? The process is every single time it's different. And the person cannot know 100%, I'm, I'm behind this, cannot know every single thing. I'm a manager. I have 30, 40% of I, like knowledge, what my team is doing, what my team is working on, but they are the masters of this thing. Like they are, they, are, they know their, their work. And if I try to micromanage them, um, that will be like really detrimental to the business actually. And it's like, and then I will be spending my time for nothing for the for detrimental thing for the business. So I don't like it uh, from both sides as a manager and as an employee, uh, but I uh, don't know actually how you can prevent it if you are being micromanaged. Um, there are, I'm certain there are some strategies, but I think uh, the best one is uh, trying to speak up, like saying, hey, um, I think the speaking up goes a really long way. And most of us are more hesitant to speak up. And once we are comfortable, like when we are comfortable with anything, we should speak up more and then to raise this question. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure if I answer the question, Karim, or Maybe you, you expect something different. I don't know. Yeah, okay, so that will be all of the questions. I think what you shared today is very, very helpful. I think like receiving feedback is something that we should all, we should keep like learning and continue to do in, um, in the working environment because as me personally, I, I remember when I first started working I was really passive on receiving feedback. Like, and I also didn't know what kind of feedback, what kind of forms of feedback that I like. And I think as like reading blog posts or like communicating with your manager, I think it definitely gets better. And you will kind of, uh, I think it improves the relationship between you and manager too, because you will understand which stage you guys are on and you know both are on the same page. So I think that's definitely really helpful. So very thankful. Thank you for your um, sharing your experience and giving this talk today. You're welcome. It was really a pleasure. And um, I'm going to share the slides on my blog later. So if anyone is interested, they can follow. Um, here are the links to my blog, my Twitter, and also my Polywork. If you want to keep up, if you have another question, you can shoot me a message in any one of them. It doesn't really matter. And I will try to uh, give an answer. That was really, really nice. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Jandas, for sharing your experience and giving this talk today again. And if you have any question for Jandas, we have some time left, so you can still put in the Q&A section that we can answer them, or you can go to our event detail page under the discussion section. You can also put in your question, or you can also connect with Jandas on his social media. He also has some YouTube videos that you can watch. Okay, so before we wrap up the event, is there anything else you want to share with the audience? No, no. focus on both sides of the feedback. Don't just focus on giving the feedback, but focus on both, that both of them will help you grow a lot. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you again for giving a talk. And I hope everyone enjoyed today's event. Um, our next hey, upcoming event will be. Sorry, guys. I have a question. I'm so sorry. I'm coming so late. No worries. Yeah. Yeah, so I was going to ask uh, regarding giving feedback that are valuable. Is there like a is there like a template or a way to go about it? Do we have yep. to make um, the feedback contextual, or should it just be generic? Is there like a template yep. of giving feedback? I think if like um, so, there's an SPI uh, framework mm -hmm. that I know: situation, behavior, and uh, how was the I? Uh, I don't like my mind is right now stopped. But there's an SPI framework that you can use. Um, that's that's a good one. Uh, but I um, definitely recommend, yeah, situation behavior impact. I definitely recommend customizing and not using just one template for the feedback because, as we said, like the person who receives feedback might not be comfortable in a way that you want to give feedback. Like you need to ask questions how they want to receive feedback first. Do they want to receive in, in a written form? Maybe they want you to have a video call. Um, that's like first, that, like if you ask for a template, that's the first thing that you need to do. Like ask them how they want to receive feedback. Then you can try to work on like, hey, okay, how can I frame my message? Then if you, if you like uh, giving feedback, is, that's why it's called kind of an art, <laughs> that they say. Um, there are certain things for different cultures, like how to give feedback. Like, for example, like, again, I'm going to mention the same book, The Culture Map. It's, it's very different from one culture to another. In some cultures, just mentioning two, th two great things, like, for example, the, the person did three things, right? And then you mention two things and don't mention the last thing at all. And they understand from this message that you, they didn't do a good job for the third thing. So I'm not like that. And there are people like that. But that's, that's what needs to be figured out first. Like how this person actually receives feedback. And there are people who are OK with that's called feedback sandwich. It's like you tell something good, you tell something bad, and then you tell something good in the end. I don't like this method at all, uh, but some people might find it useful. And some people might be very comfortable with directly giving feedback in anywhere, in any form. So, for example, I like receiving feedback in private, but the form is up to the person. They can send me a message, they can have a video call, however they feel comfortable and they can directly tell it to my face, whatever they think. They don't need to wrap it up in a good things. They can just say, hey, John Dost, what you did was really bad and these are the results. So there's no one way how to give feedback. It depends on the person who receives the feedback. But there are a lot of frameworks like SPI framework, situation behavior impact that you can use. That's, that's a good one, actually. You define the situation that you were in what you like, define it to the person when you are giving feedback and you define their behavior. Say, hey, we were in a meeting last week in this time with these people and you behave this way and then you explain the impact they had on you they, about this behavior, how they had an impact on you, on your team and etc. So this is one of the frameworks that you can use. That's one of the helpful ones actually. But again, it's up to the, uh, up to the situation. Yeah, uh, thanks for the uh, response. Now, uh, I have a second question, and it, it has to do with um, the way feedbacks are organized. Now, in my company, um, I'm, I'm a senior, I'm a senior engineer, and um, junior engineers are allowed to give feedback on our performance. So, um, those people who we look up to in terms of mentorship, who are like leads or managers who are ahead of us, are not really, are not the people we work with day to day. So they don't kind of like see how we perform. So do you think that it's, uh, it's ideal for junior engineers to give reviews, performance reviews or performance feedback to um, senior engineers or should it be the other way around? Should it be leads giving 
reviews on 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 seniors or in, or man, man, engineering managers giving performance reviews on seniors. I think there is a value getting juniors feedback because if the junior is giving feedback to their mentor, for example, that's I think really valuable. Like that's if I like I'm a manager and I would love junior engineers to give feedback because then they can also learn how to give feedback. Like that's a skill that they should learn from the beginning, right? So I would expect junior engineers to give feedback. And one thing about the feedback, I think we need to make it clear that you don't have to accept it every single time. Like you can reject feedback. Once you know that like, hey, this feedback came to you, like in a performance review or in any way, anonymous or not anonymous, doesn't really matter. You can say, yes, I heard this, I acknowledge, but I'm not accepting or I'm rejecting this feedback because of this reason. Like I need to focus on the two other things that I need to improve first, then I'm going to come to that one later. Maybe the feedback, like, and also one one thing I recently, I I, um, I heard from another person, it's not my uh, phrase, but most often the peer feedback is not about you. It's not, it's about what your peers want from you. Like that's very clear. Like all same, same applies from junior engineers. Like when you get the feedback from junior engineer, you can reject it. It doesn't matter you, you know from junior, coming from junior engineer or not. Like m- let's make it anonymous, all of them. Or if you ask me, not, let's not make them anonymous and we have an op- open feedback culture. Everyone can give feedback to each other. That Usually these cultures thrive better as, as far as I, I observed a lot. Um, but accepting feedback is up to you. Um, even if junior gives you, doesn't really matter. If you have a reasons to reject the feedback and if they are valid and if your manager say, thinks also the same, then it's, it's okay to, 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 for juniors to give feedback. They should also learn somehow. Does that answer your question, Tommy? Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Kendall. You're welcome. Okay, I think it's about time. So if anyone has any additional question, please, like I said, you can put in the discussion section on the event detail page or connect with Jonas on his social media. Okay, and that will be it for today. We also have some upcoming events next week about some job search and web development. So if you're interested, definitely go to our CME website and RSVP to those events as well. And I will leave the room open for another five minutes if people want to interact with each other or just hang around in the chat room. Yeah, so that would be it for today. And thank you, everyone. You can feel free to hang around or leave the event room. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot for joining everyone.